esoteric. So uh, parse transforms, one of the more difficult parts of um, Erlang in particular, and it's a, it's a rather interesting feature. You don't see a lot of languages uh, that have this. Um, but uh, quick background, so I'm a software engineer at uh, Panduit. What we do is build a lot of physical infrastructure. So lately we're doing some of the, the software infrastructure that runs data centers, so the, the cabling, the networking, um, and, and lately the software that, that ties all this together and helps you manage it. Uh, and we're using Erlang to control uh, data centers, the buildings and the mechanical infrastructure in that. So you look at a building like this, uh, you've got vents bringing uh, air, you've got thermostats on the wall, and then you've got a, some central computer that's really running this entire building. And the central computer is directing where it's pulling air from, uh, how much cooling it needs to put into that air, does it need to humidify it, and then which rooms it needs to put that air back into. So uh, I think there's another talk today about uh, using Erlang as a, a central nervous system for the home. Uh, we, we have, our, our application is very much like that, but specifically for the data center, and so managing the, the physical infrastructure there. Uh, I had an opportunity to write a par uh, parse transform for something that we do, uh, and it, it's one of these areas that uh, is, is somewhat unexplored, and so we can go right to our Erlang manual and figure out what it tells us um, about parse transforms, right? This is extremely helpful. Um, but what they do is let you transform an Erlang program during com compile time. So you can insert yourself, your program, in between the source code and the, the generated beam code. So look at some examples of how to do that, what's possible. Um, if you're gonna manipulate a program, you have to represent it as data. Um, you don't, you don't wanna just manipulate text, right? That's uh, not extremely interesting. Uh, so the abstract format is how you do this in Erlang. This is the format that your program takes on um, as data as it's going through the compilation process. Uh, we'll look at some tools uh, that let us work with this abstract format. It's, it's uh, as you might imagine, rather complex. Um, so there's some tools that can help us uh, deal with this. Uh, and then we'll look at what's possible. Uh, there's, there's a number of parse transforms out there, uh, some that you may actually be using and, and uh, not realize it or not realize how they're working. Uh, we'll look at some of those and, and some of the implications so that at least you understand um, what they're doing behind the scenes. And uh, lastly, Let's, uh, it's kind of a, a fun, when you're talking about metaprogramming, uh, a parse transform is something that's outside of your module, right? And it's transforming your module during compilation. What if you could bring that inside the module and have a module transform itself? And so we can have a parse transform with a parse transform, so kind of fun. Uh, start off, what is it? Typical compilation process, source code, run it through a compiler, you get your, your executable or your beam, or else see nothing, uh, nothing crazy there. Uh, unsurprisingly, one of the classic texts on compilers and how they work also has dragons because it's a rather scary subject. Um, but here, here's the steps that you go through. You, you expand macros. Um, some languages like Java don't have these. If you have, if you, you come from a C background, right? You know, there's a there's a macro processor that you go through. Erlang has the same uh, or similar. Uh, macro processor for expanding includes, for defines, things like this. And then you lex it, so you break up this giant string of text into smaller strings of text, and then you start to put these together into, ah, this string of text looks like a function call, this one looks like a variable, and you start to build up uh, what's called an abstract syntax tree, a representation of your program, but without all of the, the syntax anymore. That syntax is, ab the syntax is abstracted away. You don't, you don't need it. It's represented in the, the tree structure. Uh, lastly, you, you want to optimize this. Maybe you can uh, do things in this compilation step, manipulate this parse tree uh, to hopefully make your program run a little bit faster. And then finally, very last step, you generate the bytecode. This is what your, your beam will be executing or your, your CPU if you're going to native code. This is what the parse transform does. We're going to insert a little step right in here after we generate the abstract syntax tree, and we're gonna take that entire syntax tree for a single module, pass it off to your user function. You can do whatever you want with it, uh, including completely clobber it, and then return it back to the compiler. And the compiler takes that and continues on through the process. 
just to get things going, this is what an identity transforms. So this, this does no transformation. It just says whatever AST the compiler gives me, I'll give it right back to the compiler. Um, we're, not, we're not doing any analysis on it, but uh, you see the basics. We have uh, forms is, is the abstract syntax tree. Um, the, the way the compiler gives it to us is not really a tree. It's actually a list of trees, uh, and that's just because of the way the, the module format works. Um, and options is a compiler option. So now you have um, access to all the options that you, your, your user passed to the compiler. If we're gonna invoke one of these, we wanna run this parse transform in our code. Um, we first gotta compile it, it has to be executable. And you, you need to have it on your Erlang path here. You give this parse transform flag to the compiler. If you're doing this in rebar, uh, it's a, quite a bit simpler, so you probably uh, have one of these in your, your rebar comp for logger, right? Parse transform, logger transform. Um, you can also specify the module inline, so you don't want to run this parse transform for your entire project, you just want to run it for a specific module, you put it right there in the, the header of your module. All right, so what does is, what is this abstract format look like? We, we know what the, we, we have forms now, how do we start to transform uh, these forms, do something interesting with it? We'll, we'll take this back from a very, very simple example and then, then work up quickly. So if you have this text, A plus B times C, uh, you're gonna go through, break this up into the A, the plus, the B, the star, the C, and they're still just text, but now they're just smaller pieces of text. And then you start to recognize A is a variable, uh, plus is an operation, um, B a variable, operation variable, and you notice even though the, the text was flat, the tree is now nested, so I'm representing some of the operator precedence in my tree. So I, I, uh, uh, multiplication has a higher precedence, this goes lower in the tree. When I evaluate this tree, I'm gonna do it bottom up, so I'm gonna take B times C, and then I'm gonna take the result of that and add it to A. If I changed my operator precedence, I put some parentheses in there, so now I wanna add first, there's no more elements in the tree. I don't put the parentheses in the tree. This is the abstract part of the abstract syntax. Um, but I change the shape of the tree. So in this tree, now my A and A plus B is evaluated first, and the results get multiplied with C. So if we we're going to represent this as data, we want to be able to manipulate this tree. How would we do that? So not, uh, not very complicated here. We have a tuple. The first element in the tuple is the operation that we want to do and the next two elements are the operands. So we have uh, some very simple representations in Erlang of how a parse tree could work. Uh, let's look at some examples now. Uh, real parse trees, they get, get quite a bit more uh, complex. So here we have a uh, extremely simple module here. Uh, we wanna see what this looks like in abstract format, and this is what we'd be starting to manipulate in our parse transform. Um, as I said, the forms is not a, a single tree. It's, a, it's actually a list of trees. We see all of these module attributes. Um, let's go through these one at a time. So we have the name of the module here. This uh, dash, anything that starts with a dash becomes an attribute in your abstract, abstract form. We see we had some options here in this, in this uh, compile attribute, but they got removed. And that's because the compiler already acted on this compiler flag. It treats this inline flag as just like a flag you passed from the command line. And since the compiler already acted it on it by calling uh, our parse transform, which happened to print out this abstract syntax listing, um, we don't have it anymore. It's already been dealt with. <coughs> we have a list of, of module exports. So we're exporting the hello function of Arity1. And now we have a single function. So this uh, one large tuple represents the entire body of the function. And for every function we have in the module, we'd have one of these, these tuples representing one of the, the internal functions. Um, we can start to pick out from the source text how this translates into the parse tree. So the name of the function is hello. We see this right here. Um, there's uh, all the numbers, these are, these are line numbers, if that wasn't uh, uh, apparent. So we can take this abstract syntax tree, let's say um, you know, there's a problem and you have this access to this, you wanna generate a error message with where that problem occurred. This parse syntax tree, your syntax tree helps you um, 
do some of that. You can even regenerate your source file from the, the abstract syntax with, once you have this line number information. We pick out uh, more parts of this, so we have, we have the variable who. Uh, we see this in our parse tree as a variable. You can have much more complex things in, in your function call, right? You can have um, bindings. You can, you can match on a, a record, um, bind out variables. And so we would see, instead of just variable who here, we would see a lot more uh, uh, complex syntax tree for matching that out and then feeding those variables into the, the function body. If we had a when clause, this function doesn't, it would go here. And we'd, we'd see a whole lot more forms. This is the body of the function. Uh, it's a list, uh, and there's only one expression in this, this function body. We see only one item in this list, and it's a call to the IOF write function. So we can see where uh, we can start to pick out the pieces and correlate between our program and our, our syntax tree. These are the, the arguments to the, the IOF write function. So, okay, uh, we've got a very simple one. Let's start start transforming that. How do, we, how do we do this? So we'll work up a hypothetical uh, application here of a, of a parse transform. Let's say we know we have this ETS table and we're having some contention on it. We'll call it contentious table um, because it's very literal. And every time uh, our module code accesses this ETS table, uh, we want to fire off a message to a tracker process. And so this tracker process is going to collect all these messages and uh, give us some t statistics on how often this table's being called and uh, maybe even some, some details about that call. We could even include the process ID of the caller so that we could track um, not just how much or, or how often this table's being accessed, but who's accessing it and, and how frequently. So we want to find calls to this, uh, ETS insert, contentious table, and then some arguments. We want to insert in this tree some new code. We want, uh, we'll, we'll have a named process, ETS collector, and we'll tell it we're doing an insert and who's doing the insert here. And this, this becomes a lot more difficult because we're, we're now matching parts of this ETS insert call and putting it in our generated code. But what if we could, we could put in that message the length of the number of objects we're inserting. We can insert more, more than one object at a time and that would be, be interesting. How would we do that? Um, we don't quite get here, but uh, hopefully we will see some of the tools that would, would let us do this. So the, the first thing is, well, if I'm gonna match uh, this tuple from the abstract format, what's it gonna look like? How, what do I match on? There's some really great tools uh, from Erlang the standard library that lets you generate, do some of the, the tokenizing and, and syntax tree generation. So we're using some of those here. Earl scan generates your, your list of tokens. So it's gonna break up this string um, as if, treat it as if it was a, was a snippet of Erlang code, give us a list of tokens. We now take those and we pass this to Earl parse and this gives us a parse tree. Excellent. We can print that out. We know exactly what this is gonna look like. So here's, here's what we need to match on. We want to match on a call to ETS module, insert function, and only this specific table. If we're accessing another table, we don't want to match on it. This last bit here, the var objects gets tricky. Uh, we might have an inline list comprehension here in this ETS insert. It might not just be a variable. It might be something really complex. Uh, and and uh, this is very general, right? I mean, you could even have a case statement right here in this argument position. Um, so you're not gonna have this nice variable, variable name here, potentially. So once we find this, once we match on this, what do we wanna replace it with? Uh, so we go through the same process. We get some, some Erlang code, uh, lex it, parse it. We have our syntax tree here. This is what this uh, message call looks like in, in abstract format. Um, not too bad here. We can, we can pick out, okay, we're sending to an atom and we're sending a tuple with insert and a, a function called a self. So here we've got our transform function. We match, match on a syntax form. 
Um, we're going to actually pick the line number out here so that when we generate code and put this into our parse transform, our generated code, code just happens to be on the same line as the, the code that we're matching on. So if you um, ever try to reverse engineer this parse tree back to source code, you could, you could do something intelligent with that. And once we, we match this, we insert our replacement code. If we see anything else in the parse tree, we just pass it through completely unchanged. OK, but there's a couple of problems. So we're, we've completely clobbered the original S insert code, and we've just replaced it. We haven't, uh, we haven't added anything. We've just done a replacement. So remember, we want to turn this into uh, two, different, two different expressions, two different statements. But we don't want to change the shape of the parse tree. We're taking one node out, and we want to put one node back into the parse tree. Um, otherwise, we've got to get a lot uh, more information about the shape of this, and we have to rebuild it a lot more carefully, and it becomes extremely, um, extremely difficult. Possible. So what if we did this? Um, we now have a single node in a parse tree, so we can do a direct, direct replacement with the original ETS insert call. And importantly, we have the same expression value. So what if somebody assigned the results of the S, S insert to a variable, wanted to save that and do something with it? Uh, we don't want to change the, the value of that variable. So if we had um, you know, variable equals this begin end, we wouldn't change the semantics of the program. Uh, that, that's uh, pretty important, and it's one of the, the most difficult things to get right when you're doing the parse transform is do it without um, completely clobbering, completely clobbering the code. So here we go. We can complete this now. Uh, same, same basic process with that begin and end. So you can take that uh, begin end, run that through the, the tokenizer, the parse tree generator, and you can start to see what the abstract syntax would look like. Um, so uh, that begin and end turns into a block node in your abstract syntax tree. We have the line number, and then we just have a list of forms. So right, what, do you, what is a begin and end? Well, a begin and an end just has a whole list of, of expressions in it, um, not, not terribly complex. So we insert our new code, our new AST node, this uh, send operation here. And after that, we execute the original form in whatever it was. So again, there, that uh, it's an, it's insert could be, be a lot more complex. It have a lot more logic in it. And we're just going to preserve whatever was there. So now how do, we, how do we apply this? We're matching on a single form in this AST node. Some example code, um, completely hypothetical. Um, so you want to change a username. We have a user ID and the new name. So if the user ID is zero, you're an admin user. We're going to reject you. You can't do that. Um, otherwise, we're going to look up your user record. We're going to see what group you're in. If you're in this uh, L user group, you, you, don't, you can't do this. You don't have the privileges. Otherwise, uh, you're a user and admin, no problem. Uh, we'll go ahead and change your username for you. So we've already seen we've got something much more complex than the original examples. We've got multiple function clauses here. We've got a when clause. Uh, we don't just have a simple variable name here. We're actually doing a record, con um, record manipulation in the ETS insert. <clears throat> so let's try and see what this will look like in abstract syntax. So here's, here's what we get. And wow, I mean, that's a lot more complex. I, I really, really don't want to go through that and figure out a way to, to match on this. So, so let's take a step back for a second. Um, is there, I mean, do we really need to go now go write a function to walk that entire tree and just find what we're looking for? So um, just like that scanning and, and tokenizing, uh, the, the standard library comes with a, with a number of tools that are really helpful for this. Um, standard lib, which is where the, the scanning and parsing came from, it's got a, got a couple of great ones. Um, and they all, they all follow uh, this, this kind of classic pattern of, of how you uh, parse and uh, generate, compile uh, programs. 
So EPP, Erlang preprocessor, this deals with doing your pound defines, um, handling include files, and basically compiling the one piece of, of text that then gets scanned. That's our next model, which is how we turn a block of text into a series of, of elements in our language. Then we take those elements, we go through Erl parse, we build that into the syntax tree. There's this really, really handy module, uh, Erl pretty print. And so this can take a syntax tree and go right back to text. So we can now have this complete loop. And especially with debugging, right, you pick out some of the abstract syntax node and you pass it over to Erl pretty print and you can see exactly what that syntax node uh, would have looked like in, in source code. There's another really handy one, uh, Erl eval. And we can use some of this later. That says, instead of compiling this AST to, to bytecode or beam, I just want to run it right now. Um, which is really fun for, for some metaprogramming. We'll up a, a parse transform that uses that later. This last one, um, this isn't something that you would use in user code. This is more like a template that you could use to write your own parse transform. And it's the URL identity transform. Unlike the one that I had earlier, this identity transform actually does walk that entire syntax tree. So it has a function to match out every different form, whether it's a, uh, you know, a, a clause, an if, a, uh, a case, a function call, a send, whatever, whatever those forms turn out to be. And this one uh, will walk that whole tree and then just return it verbatim. But you can then see where you can, I, I take this function, I want to match on a function call. I'll just create a new clause for that function that matches on my specific ets insert call. And I could do it that way. Um, but it's, it's an incredibly verbose, especially if you just want to pick one thing out of a syntax tree and transform it. There's another application, uh, part of the standard distribution, that's syntax tools. This is uh, kind of the next higher level of working with syntax trees than standard lib. Unfortunately, it uses a different syntax tree than standard lib. Um, we just have to deal with that. There's, there's no way around it. Um, luckily, there's some functions to um, convert back to the standard lib format. So anything that standard lib considers to be a syntax tree, syntax tools also considers to be a syntax tree, but not vice versa. So if you do any manipulation with syntax tools, standard lib is going to choke on it. You can't, can't handle it anymore until you revert it back to that, that simpler format. Uh, these last two, URL syntax and syntax lib, are, are probably the most helpful here. Um, URL syntax has functions for helping you generate um, AST nodes. So you could, you know, of course, just generate the tuples yourself, um, but you can do this a little more functionally. And then uh, the idea is if that syntax tree ever changed slightly, the format of it changed, you're using a function interface and, and your parse transform's not going to break. Um, that doesn't mean you're insulated to additions to the language, right? Um, maps in, in Erlang 17, completely new feature. There's going to be new syntax tree um, forms to represent all the different things you can do with a map. So, um, and again, if, if you were using that um, ID trans here to write your transform, that isn't going to work anymore once new, uh, new forms are added to the language and the syntax tree changes. So some of the tools that, that syntax lib gives us insulate us from some of those underlying changes in, in the syntax tree. Oops. Uh, so there's a, there's a common pattern to this, right? We want to find a, an AST node of interest. We have an idea what, what we want to find within the code. Um, we extract some, some context, some detail about that. We create a new AST node with something changed in it. Put this, we want to replace the original node, do this, for, we want to find all occurrences of, the, of this in the program and then give it back to the compiler and the compiler keeps, keeps working with it. URL syntax lib has, has exactly what we want. We just want a map. We want a map from this AST node to that AST node. Pass it an AST, we pass it a function, and our function gets called with every single node in the AST and we have the opportunity to return a modified AST node. If you just want to do something like uh, look for patterns within source code, you don't necessarily have to transform the tree. You can do a fold operation. So again, you have your function gets called for every node in the AST, 
and, and you can store or accumulate information about the, the nodes that you're processing. Uh, there's even this really, really fun beast, map and fold, all at the same time in one pass through the AST. Uh, your function now has the AST node and its accumulator, and it has a chance to both modify the AST node and update the accumulator for, for every, every node in the tree. So now, okay, we've got oral syntax lib. We want to we want to map because we want to change something. We can use our transformer function that we worked up before. Um, you notice that we're not directly passing forms to the map function. So when we get a module, it's really a list of trees. It's not not a single tree. So we have to go through every individual tree in that list and map it uh, by itself. Um, but this bottom part, I mean, this is fantastic. We didn't have to change it at all. This URL syntax lib map was exactly what we needed. Uh, this is that different parts trees I was talking about. So everything that we have in the bottom, we got this tuple format from the URL scan and URL parse, which means it was in the standard lib AST format. So as soon as we pass these forms to URL syntax lib, it's no longer in standard lib format. So before we pass it to our match function, we have to revert it back to standard lib format. Of course, after our function maps it, it's still in under, under the control of URL syntax lib. So we have to remap it again back to standard lib form before we hand it back to the compiler. So that's fantastic, right? Um, we're done. But why not? And, and, and I mean, you can, you can start to see all the, the possibilities. Um, I can take any source code and I can change it. And I can do this for every module in my entire program. This is fantastic. And now I don't have to go through and manually instrument calls. I can enable it and disable it with a single line for my, my entire application. I mean, that's, that's awesome. But why wouldn't you want to do this? We, we just scratched the surface of the abstract syntax, um, the, the abstract format. Um, it, uh, once you get started, I think it's not as scary as it, as it first seems. Um, but it's still fairly complex, and you, you need an understanding of the Erlang grammar. And when you're looking at source code, what um, abstract syntax does that, that parse into? What, what structure does it, does it really have? Um, I mentioned this before, the, like with the introduction of maps, the abstract syntax can change. So if you're using something like the URL ID trans approach where you're manually um, walking through the entire AST and that AST changes, your code's gonna break. Use something like um, URL syntax lib, you're gonna be insulated from some of that. Um, insulated quite a bit, it's, it's actually a really good approach. Um, but there's still some potentials that the language is going to change in, in ways you didn't necessarily foresee when you wrote your parse transform. Uh, this is the big one. You have a little bug and it's very subtle. You forgot to account for some particular use case. Um, you, know, you assumed that, uh, for example, let's say we imported um, ETS insert. So we just have, our, our source code is just insert. We didn't have ETS insert. Would that be the same abstract format? Maybe, maybe not. Maybe we need to match on both of those. But that would be very hard to, uh, hard to detect. We just tested it at insert. We didn't test somebody importing the insert function and then just calling it like a, a module local. Um, if we have that bug, that just now became, became a compiler bug since we're hooked into the compiler. Um, you know, this, this one may not be a huge issue, but it could slow down compilation. Um, you now go from your compiler has to go find your module, load it in, pass the abstract forms into your module, get it back. Uh, that, that can be quite expensive, and there's often, um, often parse transforms, uh, they're already running. So you start to run multiple parse transforms, it can slow things down. Uh, this one's probably the most important. Uh, if you're significantly changing something, which is I mean, kind of the, the point of the parse transform, it can become very difficult to reason about your code. The last thing you want to do is create mistrust between what I'm writing, what I intend, how I intend my code to work, and what it's actually doing. 
uh, am I am I changing the the semantics of it in a in a possibly um, harmful way? So, sort of with those warnings, uh, let's let's look at some parse transforms that are out there. Uh, people have developed for various purposes. Um, they're actually really really fun, um, and they can get you to think about uh, completely different different approaches to to solving problems. This was the the one that I I wrote myself. Um, so the idea is we've got some great tools to go from Erlang to JSON. Uh, we've got JSX, Jiffy, many others. But they just go back and forth to things like term lists. They, they, they can't do anything with very complex uh, Erlang terms. And they certainly can't do any kind of, of type safety whatsoever. Everything you get from JSON is, is completely suspect and, and potentially dangerous. This doesn't change that. It's still potentially dangerous and, and suspect, OK? <laughs> uh, anything you, you get from the outside is. But this does one thing for you, which is really help you get the structure right. I mean, it, let, let's say you've got some Erlang records, and you want to map those back and forth to JSON. Uh, gee, it'd be really nice if you could go from my Erlang record just to a JSON object. None of the uh, JSON libraries for Erlang do that in any way. You have to give it a tuple list or something like that. Uh, so this Eon fills that, that gap. It doesn't do the JSON parsing. It says, take your JSON, run it through JSX, then hand it to Eon, and Eon will translate this back into an Erlang record. And it could even do this for a type. You can say, uh, this, Erl this uh, JSON object, try to make it into this Erlang type. And so you're going to do things like make sure it's got all of the right fields, make sure the fields have the right basic types. Uh, you know, so. Uh, Integer, integer float conversions, that kind of thing. Uh, another one is strings, right? So JSX just decides everything you get from JSON will be a binary. Well, I wanted a string, so do I have to convert that myself? And Ian says, no, if you say in your type spec that this should be a string, I'll convert that to a string for you. Uh, it can even do atoms, and it does these slightly safely. So if you have a type definition uh, that includes atoms as part of that type definition, then Oops, I think I left that out here. So privilege is another type that should be above this, and the privileges are you know, login, create, delete, grant, something like that. So these atoms are defined. Um, we're at least protected against creating new atoms at runtime. That's one of the you know, big, nasty things you never want to do is create new atoms at runtime. So at least Eon will, will protect you from that. So if, if, if you want this JSON string to be an atom, I'll do it for you as long as this atom already exists in the Erlang VM. No problem. So here's what we get. Um, whoop. We have create a user uh, record here, convert this uh, from Eon. We take the, the user record, we give it the module name. So the module name is so that Eon can find that uh, type definition up above. And it converts this to the tuple list that JSX is expecting. Now JSX converts this into JSON. And then I want to do the reverse. So I've, I've got my JSON. I decode that into my tuple list. Um, and then I say I want to try to decode that tuple list as a user record. And hey, they match at the end. That's pretty awesome. So we have, we have an exact round trip back and forth. And then at the bottom, this is, this is what the, uh, the JSON would look like. So you can see you know, user record, JSON looks pretty decent. We've got some fairly straightforward translation between Erlang atoms and JSON strings. Not bad. And here's what that looks like uh, as the parse transform. Uh, I mean, you would think, so a lot, a lot of the magic of Eon is not in the parse transform itself. That's, that's being done at runtime um, to, to convert your tuple list into, into the record. But what we don't have access to at runtime is all of those wonderful types um, you know, Evan was just talking about that in the, in the keynote about, about um, type systems and making them work for you. So once you compile the Erlang code, all of that information's gone. You don't have any access to it. It would be really nice if I could at runtime go ask, hey, what was the type of this record? Or I defined a, a user type, let's say, you know, birthday here, right? This is a tuple with year, month, day, and they're all integers. Um, it'd be nice if I could just say, I want to make sure that this JSON matches this Erlang type. So we have to pull that out of the parse tree. Luckily, it's still available in the parse tree. And we create a new function that 
uh, stores that and then can return it on request. So walking through this here, I'm pulling uh, parse trans. We'll, we'll go into this in more detail. This is a fantastic library for working with parse transforms. Um, interestingly, it uses parse transforms to accomplish some of its magic. We're going to delegate uh, the transformation to this parse transforms function, and it's going to call us. So it handles some of this sum of the uh, reverting for us and the, the translation back and forth. One of the biggest things is uh, error handling. I mean, your parse transform is going to break. Uh, you're going to have problems. You're going to have to debug it. Uh, parse, uh, parse trans really, really helps with that and finding out where things failed and what they failed on. Uh, syntax lib analyze forms. Uh, this is kind of a way to say, I want to take the whole parse tree and I want to get some summary information about it. Um, what this does is I want to find a specific attribute uh, in that um, in that module. And specifically what I'm looking for, where did that go? So yeah, yeah, so I wanna, I wanna pull all attributes out of my module. So it's anything that starts with a dash. I wanna pull all those out and I wanna process them. And because that, that, that's everything, that's my records, that's my types, um, all the stuff that, that, I'm, that I'm interested in. And so I'm gonna pull those out and I'm going to transform it, so, so that's not here, but really what I'm doing is saying, eh, if I want to store this for, for runtime, I don't care about line numbers, I can get rid of all that information. Let me simplify that type, type stuff down, and I'll just store that. Code gen, uh, this now says, remember with the, um, the message send, we actually had the abstract forms in our parse transform. What if I could just write the Erlang code and have that be in my generated code, that'd be really nice. That's kind of what CodeGen does. It says, I'm gonna create a fun, it's a fun name is, is the name of the function I'm creating, and the body of this function takes a variable, returns a variable attributes. And so attributes is bound um, outside this, this fun definition here. So what I'm saying is I'm taking all the attributes in my module, all the types, all the records, flattening it into a list, creating a brand new function that then returns that flattened list, and I'm gonna then insert these whole new forms, this whole function that I created from nothing, in, back into the parse tree. I have to export it because I want to be able to access it externally, so I have to create an export attribute, and then pass it back to the compiler. Done. Not terribly crazy. I mean, for, for, something, uh, for something like that, that, that now I have access to every, every record and type information at runtime. Uh, parse trans, as I mentioned before, um, so this is just a, not just, uh, this is a library for working, working with parse transforms. Tons of convenience functions uh, for almost all of the common cases. Error handling is one of the biggest reasons to use this. Um, code gen, that's what I was, was using in that previous one, helps you generate uh, the syntax trees very simply without actually going down into the abstract syntax format. And uh, this one's kind of fun. Uh, in the previous one, we created a new function, but you can create even entire modules. So just completely make up a new module out of nothing and, and compile that. Uh, there's another uh, part of this library is uh, Xprex, I think is how you pronounce that. And similar to Eon, it says, well, I have a record. I'm, during compilation, losing all the information about that record. It's just becoming a tuple. What if I want to access a field by name at runtime? You can't always, you can't, you can't do that with a record syntax. So Xprex gives you a way to take your record definition and create uh, accessor functions that are exported from your module. Uh, logger, so this, this is probably one of the widest uh, used ones right now. Uh, I know we've been using uh, logger extensively and uh, this uses a parse transform. Uh, I was talking to one of the authors of this last night. Uh, the reason for this parse transform, it speeds things up by, I think, an order of like 30 to 40 times uh, by not logging when you can. So logging in general is, is a very, very expensive part of your application. And if you look at any logging library from, from you know, Java, Python, Erlang, they all go to great, great lengths to do everything they can not to log anything whatsoever. 
uh, and especially not to format your string, because wow, string formatting is expensive. So taking this uh, you know, s and interpolating my variable, if there's any way I can not do that, I'd like to not do that. And that's what all of this code down here is, is really doing. It says, where's this log message gonna go? What's my current log level? And is there, do I really, really, really have to do this? Okay, then, then I'll do it. Um, that's, that's, a, that's a lot of code there. And there's, there's another uh, example. You see a lot of intermediate variables. Um, you have to be careful not to clobber those. So if you're creating intermediate variables in your parse transform, uh, you wanna make sure that you know, a previous application of your parse transform doesn't create a variable that your next invocation does. So all of the variables you create should probably be unique. But you can see all the like sixes down there. Uh, this is kind of a fun one. Um, this was been, yeah, this was a couple of years ago. Uh, the idea of this one was just to experiment with different semantics. Um, so let's say I have these, these three function calls at the bottom, right? A, B, C. There's no dependencies between each other, so I can reorder them, and I'm, you know, as long as there's no side effects, it's, as long as they're pure functions, uh, I should be able to reorder them just fine. I should be able to parallelize them just fine. What if I could just put an atom in my list of expressions there, and I have a parse transform just automatically say, run all these three in parallel, and then uh, you know, block until they're all three done, because maybe I need the results of A in the next line, something like that. So this parse transform uh, is, is doing that. And so I can give it like parallelize next two, parallelize next five, and it's gonna find this atom, use it as a marker, and then go through and, and basically spawn all of these calls in, in uh, separate processes, collect the results, and then, then continue on. Uh, sequential bind, uh, this one uh, done by spawn grid. So you might have seen code like this. Uh, you've got one variable, you wanna do one mutation to it, then another mutation, then another mutation. So you've got this like variable named one, variable named two, variable named three. Um, and then, gee, I'd like to insert something between one and two, and just, oh, come on, that's a pain. Uh, sequential bind was designed to solve that problem. So I give it this at symbol, at, uh, sequential bind knows that at is special, and now every time I see at on the left side of an equal sign, I increment this internal counter by one. Every time I see at on the right side of an equal sign, I just use the previous value of that, that counter. Um, if you go, go read some of that, uh, there's a lot of caveats. I mean, it, it, it looks like it's doing a really cool thing, and, and it is, uh, but you have to be very, very careful that you don't do something uh, like, you know, maybe you want to match on V, um, you know, so, uh, you know, V is a record, so it, uh, it's not, not completely uh, general, general purpose. So, okay, we, we've, we've built up a parse transform. Uh, we've looked at uh, some things definitely not to do, uh, some things that are really cool ideas and kind of fun. Uh, what, what are some of the takeaways? Uh, the logger use case, right, raw speed. Um, obviously, if you, if you look at what that parse transform did uh, to one single, uh, one single message, uh, it took a lot of work to get that right. And it's only in something like Logger where you have a lot of widespread use where performance is, is extremely critical that, that that effort's really gonna, gonna pay off. Um, the Xprex use case where you have extremely repetitive code generation. You know, I've got a, um, five different records with 10 different fields each. I really don't wanna create an accessor method for each one. Let me just do a, write a parse transform and have it do all that for me. Uh, the Eon use case, I'm, I'm losing type information, uh, I'm losing record information during compilation. Uh, incidentally, I think Logger does something like this, so if you have a record definition, um, it, it will pull that in so it can pretty print your record. Um, so very, very, very similar thing. This is lost during compilation and we wanna somehow preserve it. We can do that with a parse transform. Uh, sequential bind. We want, we want new custom semantics. We just really, really don't like this language feature enough and we wanna go change it. Um, the, the pair use case. So we have completely different language semantics and this is really kind of a, a research application. 
Um, it's a lot easier, it, it's difficult, but it's a lot easier than writing, writing your own compiler from scratch. Uh, and, and the last one, uh, metaprogramming. Metaprogramming is always just fun and uh, it makes you think about things in, in completely new ways. So I think in the last few seconds here, uh, we'll work up an inline parse transform, which is a parse transform that lets you write a parse transform that transforms itself. So uh, not, well, not itself, but, but at least its own module. Uh, so this is, this is it. I mean, this is the entire parse transform. Um, so what I want to do here, I'm going to look for a function in a module. And we're going to say that function will be called inline transform, not a parse transform has to be arity2, so it's gonna have forms and options, uh, and I'm going to pull that out. So after compilation, this function won't exist anymore. And then I'm gonna take everything else, or sorry, um, so once I get this function definition, uh, I just want the code. I don't, want, I don't need to know the variables or the, the when clauses or if there's multiple clauses, we're just gonna assume there's one. Um, so uh, obviously this is, this is uh, not complete, this is, this is uh, minimal for demo. But I wanna go into that whole function AST, just pull out the, the expressions there. Now I want to transform this. So this is the early valve. This is where I can just take an abstract syntax tree and I can execute it uh, right now without, without uh, compiling it. And so what I get, I have to manually bind the variables so if your inline transform has like AST as the first variable instead of forms, this will break. Um, we could pull that out of the function clause, but um, you know, just for brevity, I didn't. And then finally, um, you know, last, we wanna revert the transform forms back. So now our inline transform doesn't have to do that, that uh, nasty bit. And so here we go. Uh, this was the example that we worked up before. Now it's not an external parse transform, now it would be running as an inline parse transform within, within the module. Um, the, the big one here is before we had our match function external, we, we had it as a separate function. But because the module that inline transform is in isn't compiled yet, we can't call other functions in the same module, they don't exist. So everything here has to be completely inline, right? so it has to be inline fun. Um, but yeah, it's not terrible. Um, we still have to do the revert internally because we're still doing a, a map over the forms, but uh, not bad, not bad. It's a completely inline module transform, and so now we have a module, uh, a, a parse transform enabling more parse transforms. Um, got a couple minutes, uh, any, any questions? How, uh, thanks for coming, yeah. Um, dialyzer is working at a different level. Can you repeat the question? Yeah, oh, sorry, thank you. Uh, so the question is, does dialyzer support this? Does dial or does it, does it cry? Um, and the answer is, dialyzer doesn't know um, because what dialyzer sees is the transformed code. So the transformed code is the source code that dialyzer, dialyzer sees. Um, I'd have to go back and double check that, but because that transformed code is, um, you, know, you know how you have to compile your module debug to get dialyzer to work? Um, the final version of the AST, after all the parse transforms, gets stored in the beam code, um, uh, in debug mode. Um, and so dialyzer is working off of that. So I think that tells me, yeah, di dialyzer, all it sees is the final result that never sees the original, original source code. Yeah. <laughs> right. Like, are there equivalents for tools like GenSim, OneSolve, things like this for like the standard toolbox for list macros? On right. Side? Okay. So, so the question is about list macros. Um, your list macros have capabilities to solve some of the problems, like uh, variables. Um, if I have two parse or parse transform that I'm maybe executing twice in a row within the same function and I create a new variable in the first one, maybe that variable is gonna bleed into the second one and that could be very bad, or it could be intentional, right? Um, but you have to have a way to control that. Um, and, and Lisp, which uh, embraces macros uh, much more heavily than Erlang, has great ways to deal with that. Um, the parse trans module does have some limited ones. 
uh, for things like generating a, a unique variable within a function. Um, but uh, you're, it's going to be a little bit more painful than it would be in, in something like Lisp. Yeah, thanks. Good question. Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. or everything that was before. I wanted to implement a small Zindex feature, and I found that it wasn't possible because I was trying to use invalid ads. I had to right. change the comments. Have you found any way around that? Or no, no. So OK, so the question is, um, how, how could I change some more basic elements of the syntax in Erlang? And because of where the parse transform inserts itself in the process, um, the, the lecture is already run, so you can't introduce a new operator because the lecture is going to the lecture can't understand that, and the lecture has to run before your parse transform, so you're you're never going to get to your parse transform, um, and and the answer is no, parse transforms just can't do that, right? The the way it is in the in the process. Now you can take Earl scan and, and you might extend that, but now you're not talking Earl C anymore. You're you're talking um, something radically different than than standard Erlang. Like probably a custom distribution of Erlang, something like that. Yeah. Other other questions? Yeah. Uh, is there any relationship between like what's the relationship between that string format and core? And core. Um, so I, I'm not not expert at this, but core Erlang, there, there's a, is what the AST I think compiles to. Um, so the question is the relationship between ASTs and core Erlang. So core Erlang is like a simplified Erlang, um, and it's part of the, the compilation process. I think you go from, from AST to core Erlang and then core Erlang to, to beam code. And so the, the parse transforms are, are right there at the original AST, and the, the core would be generated from our transformed AST. All right, fantastic, yeah. And uh, regarding this question about switch macros and so on, so if, if you want to start uh, experimenting with uh, doing uh, part transforms or just looking at and manipulating uh, ASD, ASD in Erlang, the first thing to look at is the Earl syntax module, and in particular, the recent addition to it that was added in the ASD. Yeah, yeah. So um, for for the video, we have the author of Earl syntax here, and uh, he was mentioning um, Merl is is sort of the next step after you you understand abstract syntax, dealing with it. Merl can now do this much much uh, more succinctly, and um, uh, hopefully also insulate you further from changes in the in the uh, abstract syntax format. So um, definitely something to to take out if you're. Or um, take a look at if you're if you're going to be doing this uh, in any production type form. So. Thanks for coming. Uh, appreciate it.